So the degree that you want something is the degree you're afraid of not having. Yeah. God, I wish I started when I was younger. I go, well, yeah, but you didn't. So shut the fuck up and let's <laughs> right. keep going. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nobody changes until they change their energy. And when you change your energy, you change your life. Because it's not till then that it's really real. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is way worse than I thought. It's like, oh yeah, it's way, way worse than you thought. Yeah. But luckily there's more to you than you think. What's up, Eric? What's up, Aubrey? Welcome for coming. Thank you for coming on your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. So it's a little over a week since I got out of the darkness, and uh, it's about time to talk about it. Yeah. It was, um, I think, by far the most powerful medicine journey I've ever been on. There's been nothing that's even come close to really reaching the depth that this journey has reached. And from the level of challenge of integration to the level of depth of uncovering, you know, aspects of my psyche. Um, and even to the vision state itself, which I'd heard about, but yeah. I kind of discredited. I was like, y'all don't know visions. I, I've done DMT. I've done DMT know. a lot. Like I know, <laughs> I know what visions are. I'm sure yeah. your visions are cute, but fuck man, this was like, this one is, as deep as I could have possibly imagined, way deeper than I possibly could have imagined. And anybody who's saying that, you know, DMT isn't produced in the brain, I recognize that it's virtually impossible to create the vivisection at the point of a visionary state. Like who's right. gonna volunteer to let their brain be opened or like, you know, stabbed at the point that they're having a DMT rush. But um, I'm Go quite run the experiment. Yeah, I'm quite confident in uh, in the endogenous production of DMT. Obviously, this could be a function of some kind of imagination, but we'll get into all the visions. But that wasn't really why I was called for it because I got a lot of ways that I can see things in in the yeah in my what third was eye. it about the darkness? Because I remember when you first heard about it, it was all that you were talking about for a while. What about it called to you? You know, I I think um, <clears throat> it's a very difficult thing to answer when something calls to you mm -hmm. because it doesn't call with reasons, right? particularly. It's like you hear the calling and then you apply the reasons <laughs> to justify and make sense of the calling. Yeah. But really, I was sick and I needed mm. to heal. And this was something that whatever that higher intelligence inside of me, call it the soul if you want, if you're comfortable with that vocabulary. I do want. <laughs> whatever that thing is was saying, you need medicine, and yeah. the medicine is the darkness. And it was just so, it was so clear. Yeah. It was just so clear and irrefutable when, you know, when I had heard about it from Akshay on the podcast, and that was the second time I heard about it because Aaron Alexander mentioned it, I was, and I heard him describe it, I was like, oh, I have to do this. Yeah. And we're going to use the structure of the hero's journey to kind of weave the thread of everything that happened. And so stage one is the ordinary world. And so what was the life that you were in before you heard this call? Like, what was the sickness? Like, how were you sick? What was going on? The thing about being sick when you're in the ordinary world is you don't know how sick you are. Right. You know, you're blaming it on little things that, oh, well, this thing is bothering me. You externalize your internal sickness, right? Mm -hmm. Well, if I could just fix this thing, if I could fix this relationship, things would be I'll Gucci. Be good, yeah. You know, if I could <laughs> fix this thing, things would be Gucci. Oh, I'm just a little tired today. Like if I could, maybe I need a little cleanse or maybe I need yeah. this little thing. So you're focused on the body. You're focused on the externalization of all your challenges, but you don't really realize what the true sickness is inside. And it, honestly, it took me five days in the darkness before i really realized what the sickness was and yeah. and we'll get to that but really it was almost as if you know i was quite confident going into the darkness and i didn't think the darkness was going to be able to break me and i was right the darkness wasn't going to be able to break me because i was already broken mm. and the darkness had to put me back together mm. and as soon as the darkness put me back together it fucking broke me yeah you know and that was like that was the interesting part was and, and broke me in a good way sure. you know like kind of cracked me open from um my own kind of delusional 
mental pathologies that I'd been yeah. living in. Yeah, the way that I think about it is that if your leg breaks and it heals crooked, you can walk on it, but it's painful. But if you are going to heal it, you have to re-break it. And yeah. It has to be reset, and then that allows it to heal properly. Yeah. You know? And I think the ordinary world is something that a lot of people can identify with, that you don't know what it is that's wrong, but you know that something is off. And it's not until you go through the hero's journey that you recognize what it was that was wrong. Yeah. There's a great quote from Khalil Gibran that I was using before I went in, and it really resonated. And um, it basically says there, every man is two men, one who sleeps in the light and the other who wakes in the darkness. Mm. And the ordinary world is the world of sleeping in the light. Yeah. Right. Like we just we're going through the motions. We're doing what we're supposed to do. We're accomplishing the things we're supposed to accomplish. We have the relationship that everybody is applauding us for. We have the the body, the meat suit that everybody's like, nice fucking suit. And you're <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty good. Right. Not so bad. Yeah. You know, like and then whatever outfit you're wearing, whatever other things, what car you're driving, what are, all of these things that people are reinforcing like, yeah, good job, man. You're doing yeah. great. And the ordinary world saying like really good, but inside we're like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's there's the, some problems. It's the young Buddha in the palace walls, and his father gave him all the women and all the feasts and all the parties. But a part of him knew, you know, because he saw death for the first time. He's like, I have to leave. Yeah, I have to go. He even had babies. I didn't know that. I yeah. think he had babies in the in the palace walls. Can someone look that up? Did Buddha have babies? I think he had like he did the whole thing. Yeah. Like he had like, he had the whole setup inside the palace walls, yeah. but that was his ordinary world. But it still wasn't, it still wasn't. It wasn't his calling. It wasn't his calling. Yeah. You know, something was still off, even though he'd had everything that everybody was looking for. What does it say? He, had a, he had just had a child right before he left. Just mm -hmm. had a child right before he left. I mean, he did the whole ordinary world thing all yeah. the way to the end. Yep. Feasts, the women the childbirth the whole thing yeah and nothing could you know nothing could kind of quench his call to adventure which is the yeah. second you know second stage of this journey yeah and so let's get into the call for you um what was the call and i guess how did it arise in your life and then how did you say yes because you went on this trip and there was a lot that had to happen to get you to the point of walking through that doorway into the darkness can you kind of tell us what that story was it was it was almost like it was just a i heard the call and i i've had enough experience hearing calls and knowing when the call is clear enough and mm -hmm. knowing the source of the call yeah like the source of this call is not like the call when my homie's like yo i'm throwing a party <laughs> trip it's on a yacht like here are the yeah. instagram profiles of the people who yeah. are coming like it's gonna be sick like that's a call that comes from maybe my groin and my head. And I'm mm. like, yeah, that sounds fun. The ego, Let's fucking yeah. do that. That's a different type of call. Mm. That's, you know, lust and desire and the desire to chase a thrill or a pleasure or an yeah. experience. This was something much, much deeper. And so it was a, I know enough now that that call is undeniable. Yeah. So we just started looking at the locations and ended up settling on the perfect location out in the Black Forest in Germany. Uh, little town i think it's called sachben walden which i think uh one of the drivers told me translates to the middle of nowhere mm, perfect but it's just this like beautiful pastoral you know landscape out there and um led by a retreat director who spent 10 years studying under a guru in india spent a month in isolation in a dark cave and is like Damn. deeply steeped in the meditative traditions yeah. of uh the hindu lineage has a beautiful family in this house and eight dark rooms and uh you know it's just they go under the name darkness retreat mm -hmm. you know and and that's um and that was the place that ended up and it ended up working out and it ended up happening to be right on the tail end of this crazy trip to poland that yeah. i took with a bunch of great dudes uh, like a real communities you know of men that just flourished in the in the initiation underneath mm. the cold with wim hof which was like a in some ways a great preparation because it it told me that i could push through challenges mm -hmm. that were incredibly extreme you know i mean we climbed mount Shnishka, which was a four and a half hour climb without a shirt on 
and it was like sleet and snow. We spent 10 minutes in an ice bath where we had to break the type, top of the ice, and I spent you know over two minutes underneath the water and all stuff like I'm not recommending necessarily, <laughs> but nonetheless, having everybody there supporting was just a huge element of that and also you know taught me to you know what was possible when i really yeah. like set my mind straight but it also was exhausting for sure it was I, so i did not come in fucking rested no two things come up um when you were talking and i think the first one is you're used to going through this cycle so you know when you hear that soul call that it's pointless to refuse but for most people and i think you did a good point articulating that there's kind of two calls there's the ego call where the moment you hear the ego call you want to do it there's no resistance <laughs> yeah but when you hear the soul call for most people your first reaction to it will be the ego being like no no i can't have that conversation i can't go do that thing outside of my job i can't go on this adventure and i think that recognizing that if you feel it and the first reaction is fear and resistance, that's probably the soul calling. And the other thing that comes up is the beauty of going to Poland first. It kind of reminds me of like when one of the knights would go, like when they knew they had to go on one of their quests, they would all get together in the meat hall, congregate, have that community, because they didn't know, you know, mm -hmm. if they'd be coming back so they could reconnect to their tribe, but then they got to go out alone. Yeah. Into the forest is almost always where they go and where did you go into the into dark the forest. forest yeah yeah into the darkness yeah those are those are both good points i think that um it was interesting seeing the projections of other people when i would tell them about this mm. like i've i've done virtually every psychedelic drug that's out there from from a plant source yeah and all in the traditional ways all with the shamans all in the ways and people are pretty comfortable with that mm. you know people aren't really that scared they're like oh have a great time man have a great journey but i would tell people i was going into the darkness and isolation and darkness where it was going to be silence and blackness pitch yeah. blackness and people were like don't fucking do that mm. <laughs> like that's crazy you're gonna go insane like yeah. i think people were projecting their own fears of that thing which is a very interesting thing i mean they were projecting their own refusal of the call which yeah, is dog. the step three of the step three of the journey right yeah. like the refusal is like this is too scary mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is what's too scary you alone with your mind right are you scared of your mind i mean that's the that's the thing right yeah. you know and people have other reasons they're scared of the dark well what if someone snuck in the room and i'm like okay you know like you're in a house with like 12 people yeah what if yeah. and like there's i guess there's some miniature chance but i don't think that's really why people are scared of the dark it's not, no. you know they're scared of they're scared of having to deal with their mind without their any distraction their shadow all of the recesses you know you're in you're in the true cave yeah of your psyche and i think the thing that comes up for me is all the traditional plant medicines they have a container that's been built over centuries and they have guides. And I think a lot of people rely on the container and the guide because they're afraid that they won't be able to handle themselves. But darkness, it's just you. It's only you. But you are also a lot more than you think you are. That's what you learn. That's what you learn. And, you know, I mean, I, in some ways, I kind of like, I kind of flippantly brushed off some of their concerns. Like, <laughs> what am I going to, what is my mind going to kick my ass? Yeah. You know, like I knew it was going to, I knew it was going to be hard, but I didn't realize yeah. like how grueling yeah. it would be to really confront everything when you start peeling off the yeah. protective layers and the armor that you have. And you really have to come face to face with literally zero distraction. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that you can do in in that environment and we'll talk more about the environment yeah that was the next question i was about to ask yeah. before we get into meeting the mentors can you kind of set the stage <clears throat> like what was your cave what was the container what did it look like what was like what was the meat suit patterns that were the container of this experience yeah so all right so you go up you know a lovely family that runs this the retreat director's name is Bharati. she's the one who studied in india underneath the guru she spent three years doing mantras and meditations until she could finally see visions and then as soon as she saw visions in her third eye her guru was like okay now go to the cave and she spent 30 mm. days in a cave 
in the darkness. And then, you know, a couple days into the cave, her visions exploded into her mind and she was actually getting kind of pissed off. She was like, you made me do mantras 14 hours a day for three years and all I had to do was go in the cave and I could get these visions. Yeah. He's like, well, I wanted you to learn the hard way. Mm. You know, like I wanted you to learn that way first and then the cave will show you, you know, kind of what you're really capable of. Yeah, you know he started I mean? her, or she showed her how to start a fire and yeah. the darkness was all the fodder. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it's interesting thinking back to, you look at all of these kind of mystical traditions. Mm-hmm. You read Rumi's writing and he has some really interesting quotes. You even go back to some biblical teachings. You know, Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. Initiation rituals. Well, what's, what is the signature of the desert? I mean, maybe it was an actual desert, but the Bible is full of allegory. Mm-hmm. It's full of metaphor, yep. right? Like that's the only way that you can actually read it. To get the most wisdom The out desert of sure. is an environment that's absent of life. It's absent of distraction. It's absent of anything else. That's one of the, one of the beautiful parts of desert medicine yeah. is that it's just kind of you and yourself. You're not interacting with a lot of animals. But the ultimate desert is the darkness yeah that is the complete removal of everything else and so it's it's kind of curious to me and i, and I would hypothesize that the most enlightening experience would not be to go to just a sandy place and just chill under a tree in a sandy place which i'm sure the isolation the vipassana of just being alone in a sandy place where the sun comes up and the sun comes down i'm sure that's valuable but you really want to go deep the desert is a cave you know, the desert is the black, that luxurious, you know, <laughs> everything that's available in the black and the yeah. opening of all of your other extrasensory faculties, you know. So it was curious to kind of think about that. And then there's some Tibetan Buddhist traditions where they stay in caves for 49 days. Right. There's some other mystical traditions where medicine, young medicine men and women are kept in caves for most of their childhood. There's a lot of these other things pointing to this, but I think the fear around it is pretty significant for sure but the thing itself is actually fairly comfortable so imagine like a rectangular room Mm -hmm. you walk through the door i got a little cot to my left and the cot has they actually upgraded the bedding for me had a little neck pillow had a little memory foam nice really (laughs) nice then to my right as soon as i enter the door is a little table where i can eat and a little chair with a rattan kind of wood that's around it and that's very important because i (laughs) fucking smashed my face on it so and then there's a window that's completely blacked out that you're able to open because that's the only way to get in circulation and then there's a radiator underneath the window and then there's a tiny little toilet and a shower and then there's a dress there's a dresser and in the other like far left hand side there's a dresser and then there's a little uh tiny little couch thing where it's like a one seater mm-hmm. and a um a yoga mat so the whole room is probably 20 foot by 10 foot and um but cozy mm-hmm. and then to get into the room you go through two doors and then you go into this little hallway across from my door was another room another blacked out room and then if if i went left then that was where they dropped off the food so it's almost like there was an in-between chamber between where in-between you were sleeping chamber. and where they were all exactly. that you could go meet, but it was still completely black. Completely black. So there's a little hallway in there. And then if I went to the right, that took me through two doors into the main house. If I went left, it took me to the end of the hallway where they would drop off my food. Mm. And they would ring a little bell and drop off my food. So the, this in-between chamber was where they would leave food and you would walk out there. Yeah, so you'd but it was open still your door, dark. walk out, and get the food. Got it. And um, so I kind of spent the first day when I arrived just kind of memorizing, memorizing the place. Yeah. And they had a couple little, um, they had two little girls who lived in the house, which was really sweet. And one of them picked out this necklace that I have. You can hear me kind of rolling the beads if you're just listening. Uh, they're called Ruk- Rudraksha seeds. And um, they come from this, these sacred trees in India, and they each have different meanings depending on how many quote eyes they have it has another hindu name but um they look like little brains i know they do look like little brains and she just picked it out for me her name was ananda and she's i was like which necklace should i have Mm. she's like oh this one i was like okay i'll bring that in and i'm really glad i did because this was kind of like a anchor this was my little blankie (laughs) this is my blankie as things got like really gnarly there in the black which they certainly did 
So then I spent everything, you know, the first night just kind of memorizing everything and just like, okay, this is where this is. This is where my clothes are. These are where all my supplements are. This is where everything that I need is. This is where I have extra nuts in case I'm hungry uh, because the diet was raw vegan. So I wanted to make sure I had a little extra protein. So got some nuts and had a few different things. And I was like, all right, I think I got everything (laughs) sorted out. And, uh, Next day, went for a little hike, you know, shot a little video footage on my phone, which I don't know what I'm going to do with, but maybe there'll be, uh, because it's quite a bit of video footage. You actually watched one that I did infrared in the dark with Mm -hmm. my mindfold. Um, And then prepared and uh, prepared to go in. The other thing about that is you have a mindfold blindfold. So if people don't understand the mindfold blindfold, this is technology like anything else is technology, even though it's not electronic. It is the absolute best blindfold for blocking out all light and allowing you to open your eyes. So if anybody is looking for a blindfold for meditation, for any kind of work, like look up the mindfold blindfold and it's phenomenal. And that's essential for this because as I said, to get circulation into the room, you have to open the window. So before you open the window, you got to put on your mindfold so you still continue to block out all light. Yeah, because when you're in that state, the smallest sliver of light will look like a fucking flashlight or a sun. Yep. And it will start to, you know, if you if you have a light accident, which I did have actually at one point, a light accident. They call them a light accident. It's like yeah. you like spilled light on yourself. Yeah. Then it will slow down the visions right. that you have significantly because your brain will start to trigger whatever response. I mean, they have their theories about it, right? And And we're venturing into the unproven. Basically, what they're saying is that when your body's used to the circadian rhythm of light, you know, triggering the hormonal responses and then diminishing melatonin and then darkness increasing melatonin, which I know some people point to the fact that this doesn't work exactly this way for blind people. And I don't know how that really works with blind people, the circadian rhythm and the melatonin cycle. But I, it is known that light affects the melatonin cycle and circadian rhythm. Right. So I think for people who are adapted to light, that when you're in darkness, that's when the melatonin spikes. Right. My understanding of it is that even if you're blind, your eyes are still receiving information that photons are hitting it, but your brain isn't converting it to images, and it's the absence of the photons that trigger the hallucinations. I think that I think that makes sense. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Um, for sure. Be cool to talk to like a scientist about this, especially given this experience and given sure. my extensive experience with DMT yeah. and being like, yo, like what <laughs> do we got same, dog. like what do we gotta do besides cut someone's brain open to kind of prove that this mm-hmm. is happening here? So that would be interesting to do. So, anyways, um we start off with uh we start off with the process and Bharati, you know, she sings some Hindi songs mm-hmm. and then you know, we have a candle and then she blows out the candle mm. and it's just pitch black. And there I am in the darkness. And one of the things that I want to lay out for people is that the hero's journey is not this linear, like step by step by step. It, it often, you can jump between these things. They're archetypical stages of experience of basically transformation. And that stage four is meeting the mentor. And on one level, Bharati was a mentor. Totally. But, but once you got into the darkness, the, the real darkness mentor, the mentor, right, and then the visions were the mentors, you know? Yeah. But if we're going to put this structure onto the story of the hero's journey, stage four, meeting the mentors, that was Bharati, that was her creating this container for you, and then crossing the threshold was when she blew out the candle. Yeah, that was it. That was the cross, crossing the threshold moment. And then... Once you cross the threshold, you're in a new ordinary world. Right. Like your ordinary world is gone and your new world is not so ordinary, but it's it's your world. So like the immediate thing that you realize is you start to learn about how to navigate that world. Mm. Right? Like you take a shit. You don't know when you're done wiping. What are your options? You're gonna smell the toilet paper (laughs) or are you just gonna hop in the shower? Well, I chose I'm just gonna hop in the shower. So I you know, all of my showers were dictated by when I needed to take a shit. Yeah. Because that was like the only way that I knew I was gonna be clean. Yeah, and like in in the hero's journey, you know, there's the ordinary world. Crossing the threshold puts you into the special world or the unusual world or the unordinary world. And a part of the trials is learning simply how to be in that new place because it's not what you used to know and the fact of removing all sight 
Like what was once the ordinary world is now the unordinary world. Yeah. And a part of being a human is we have to make the unordinary ordinary in order to function inside of it. So you had to relearn how to shit, how to brush your teeth, totally. how to walk, how to eat. Okay, so brush, talk about brush your teeth, right? Like it's so hard to see things in the dark, like getting the toothpaste in the right amount on the toothbrush head, <laughs> I realized very quickly was impossible. Yeah. So here's how you brush your teeth. You brush your teeth by flipping open the toothpick, toothpaste and squeezing it in your mouth <laughs> and then just grabbing the toothbrush and then rubbing it around. Yeah. Like there's no putting the toothpaste on the toothbrush. Like that, that doesn't work, right? And then with food, you really are just in a state of like trust with what you're eating. Like you can't really look at it. And so, you know, and, and I, I would kind of feel it. And this was another big thing is, you know, I have, I'm constantly washing my hands and sanitizing my hands. And I recognize that while this may have some pragmatic benefit, it is also me like coating my hands in a constant little layer of fear. Mm. It's my fear of getting sick and it's my fear of transferring yeah. germs, right? So I'm caught in this weird thing of, is this practical or is this just actualizing my fear but in the darkness like you really don't have that opportunity because your hands are your sight mm. so you're touching everything you have to like touch all of your food yeah you have to touch the walls to find your way you have to touch all of the things around you i would have spent the entire time just fucking sanitizing my hands from all the things i was looking for on the ground looking for on the wall so i had to be like you know what like this just isn't gonna work yeah you know i have to like let go of this thing that I'm used to and like embrace that fear. Yeah. And what's yeah. interesting is that's that, that feels like it reveals that in your waking life, when you have sight, the constant sanitizing of the hands is like you're amputating a part of your sense body because if, if you don't allow yourself to use your hands to experience the world, it's like you're removing a part of your tools. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And thinking about it constantly, what, what kind of occupation of thought, is that going on in my mind where I'm constantly like, oh, well, I've touched that. I better wash my hands after <laughs> yeah. I've touched that. And now if I'm eating food, like I got to stop that. Like, I don't know how many times I go to a restaurant and before I'll even have the bread or do anything, it's like, ah, sorry guys, let me just go to the restroom or maybe I'll have some hand sanitizer in my fanny pack. And like, maybe that's prevented me from getting sick once or twice in my life, you know? But if you really read about it, like, that's usually not why you get sick. Yeah. You get sick because you're around somebody who's fucking sick. You know, like it's okay to touch things. Yeah. You know, but you just get used to these habitual patterns. And so wrestling with my wellness was definitely something that was exposed quickly yeah. from that from that thing. The other thing is silence. Like mm. people are talking about the darkness. Yeah. And the darkness is, you know, obviously the main medicine there, but it's also silent silent like that in and of itself is intense mm. you know and for those of us who've been in a sensory deprivation tank that's the point yeah is silence and darkness but it's short and <laughs> and the weightlessness gets you in this kind of meditative process and then at a certain point you start to stir and you're like okay good oh my session's over the session's not over no dog it's just like it's continual so to break up the silence they had barati had a device in there which is a little speaker with no lights and you just click it on and it does one thing and it has uh they call it an ohm box and it plays ohm on a 15 second loop whoa indefinitely so it's ohm, ohm. <laughs> and that's like all you got oh. that's all you got so your choices are dead silence or the own box, or you can, if you're getting fresh air, you can put your mindfold on and open the window and you'll start to hear some outside sounds, yeah. which are quite lovely. The outside sounds were actually my preference, mm. but the mindfold itself gets irritating to the eyes. And so you can't keep that on for like longer than an hour without yeah. that being like an irritant. Right. So it was just this kind of balance of like silence ohm on repeat which eventually became maddening because yeah. i kind of like over relied on that and then the outside which was like the moments of heavenly sound yeah. of just hearing an occasional bird or hearing a rooster and just to bring something. awareness like 
all of us in a in our day when we're on autopilot it's literally maybe one second of no stimulus and our brain instantly reaches for the cacophony of things that we go to to not be still <clears throat> and like i could go a week and not have more than a single second of non-reactive seeking of stimulus and the fact six days yeah like <clears throat> i remember the day that you went in i was going to bed that night and like it came up in my head like what if i did this and I, I felt my face get flushed <laughs> with fear when I was laying in bed mm -hmm. thinking about, like, I don't think I'm at a point in my life where I could do this, like where I could do six days. I was shocked at what an initiation it was. Like, I, I was called to it, and so I kind of came in with a certain, conf <clears throat> a certain confidence and a certain thoughtlessness about yeah. it. But I was really shocked at the intensity of it. Yeah. Um, you know what you what you just said though reminded me of kind of in in one of the last days the first few days were really hard escalating into kind of like peak challenge probably around day three or four in certain ways there was also another secondary really deep challenge on day five and i want to go through all the days yeah but i remember in, in one of the lighter moments on day five i was thinking like man I used to complain about long plane flights. <laughs> you fucking puss. <laughs> Complaining about long plane flights? Oh, you have your favorite books and you have movies and you have someone you can talk to and you can order things from a fucking and you can see? stewardess and you can see <laughs> and you can listen to all your music and like you're in a virtual parrot. Oh, and you have to change. Like I don't like I don't like, you know, changing. I don't have I don't like connecting flights. I'm like Oh, you have to go to an airport where there's tons of people and things you can buy and snacks you can have. And like, you're worried about that. And you can hop on your phone and call whoever you want or text someone and you'll hear something back or communicate with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people on your social media. You're complaining about that. Like, get the fuck out of here. You know, because in the, in the darkness, in the isolation, you got nothing. Yeah. You got none of that. You know, and so it really shifts, like shifts your appreciation for these times that we think are bored. Like, oh man, yeah, long plane flight. You had everything. Yeah. You know, yeah, all right. Maybe you can't go to the gym when you're on the plane. You know, maybe you can't run around. Like there's slight limitations to the radical freedom that we're used to when we're home or when we've arrived somewhere. But it's still like a paradise of yeah. activities and things that you can do, both distractive and like informative and accretive to your life in, in all of the different ways. Yeah, and it's a reflection of hedonic adaptation that if we're unconscious, our mind will take for granted the symphony of perfection that's happening and will only look for the things that we wish were different. Yeah. <clears throat> and by removing all of it, you know, it really reconnects us to the gratitude. Like we live in a banquet like everyone listening to this because i'm sure there can there are people who will tell the story oh i'm not aubrey i don't have what aubrey has he's talking shit that i can't relate to if you have the time to hear this and you have the means to listen to this like you are in the one percent of the world you know like <clears throat> you are living in a feast and it's, it's really easy to take it for granted if you don't put yourself through these types of initiation rituals. And you don't have to go in darkness for six days. You could simply go outside, turn off your phone, spend one hour not reacting, and then the whole day is more delicious. Absolutely. And, you know, I mean, people who are judging, you know, this idea of judging something that's better, you know, and I know I'm jumping around here a little bit, but one of the things that I was invited to after my fourth day in the darkness was the family gets together, Bharati and the family, and every night as part of their um, spiritual tradition, they sing songs and chants mm. together at night. And they, so her, her husband, and her two daughters, and then anybody else who's been helping in the kitchen, and any other guests that they want to invite to their family thing, get to go down there and sing. That's beautiful. And it was absolutely beautiful, man. I mean, this is a, this is a, humble house in in Sachpen, Walden, Germany. 
but having everybody around there and there's certain songs where they have like think a three-year-old and a five-year-old the five-year-old can sing a little Mm. bit the three-year-old all she can do is run around in between us and i have my blindfold on but i could hear the bells she has a little Mm. bell and she just rings this bell and i thought about it and i was like this is fucking family yeah like this is the most important thing period and i remember back to my own childhood i remember when my family we all lived in a two-bedroom cabin on a on a place in dripping springs this was when i was still in high school and my mom my mom my stepdad and my three sisters lived in the master bedroom i had my own bedroom which was basically just a bed and all there was was a living room kitchen Mm. that was it it was like it was like a basically like a trailer sized home yeah it was absolutely the happiest time our family had ever had yeah because every night you know what you know what there was to do nothing we didn't have tv so we just put on music and we sang and we danced and we did karaoke performances and we just hung out with each other yeah and it was like the happiest time like we all went to bed so full and now you know there's mansions and there's you know big places you know obviously my stepdad's business has flourished and everything is on a bigger scale but what was the best time the best time wasn't that the best time was when we were all in that little cabin you know and i think the best time for that family that i was staying with is when they're all just singing together and they're all like right there together so this idea that more makes you happier that really starts to dissolve yeah. because you don't care about that. Like, what did I? What did I ultimately care about? I just cared about like hugging the people I loved. Yeah, you know, I just cared about being able to talk to them. Music alone, like all of us can listen to music. If you're listening to this podcast, you can listen to music. You know what a fucking gift it is to listen to music. Like that, is, it's just incredible. Yeah, when you've been in silence for so long, like music is so rich in its own like in its own way and and all of the things we get to experience nature all of these things it's not like i was like man i miss my i miss my really nice watch no (laughs) you know i miss my i miss my blah 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 it was not that it's like you miss the the real stuff the The things that stir your soul yeah not the ego exactly exactly and that's those are really important lessons because we can get stuck and stuck in this more for more's sake growth for growth's sake but it may actually be taking us farther from what we really, really want. Yeah, which is intimacy, which is mm-hmm. the opposite of space that the mansions and the cars and the planes give because yeah. that increases space. Yeah. Whereas what the soul wants is like, I want you next to me. We're singing, we're hugging, we're loving. And if you look, you know, you, you listen to my podcast I did with Travis Christofferson and he talks about how loneliness, yeah. self-reported loneliness is the number one indicator of premature death. Yeah. And the blue zones, you know, they they keep looking to dietary, you know, reasons for the blue zones, which are areas where people live a long time. Mm-hmm. And he's like, it's not the diets. The, the diets vary a little bit and they're usually decent, but some have a lot of rice, some have a lot of olive oil, some have a lot of yogurt. You know, you can point to whatever thing that you that you like, but ultimately they're all in places that are packed very closely together. Communal. So there's a sense of community yeah. that you're around people, you're inviting people over for dinner. There's people constantly in your life. You're close in yeah, close man. proximity, and that's that's I think really what fills fills us with that kind of joy and love that not only keeps us alive but makes life worth living. Yeah, the thing that comes up is it's almost like our psyche has evolved to be a part of a body of people, and that when you buy the mansion and you have the job, it's like a tourniquet around the hand and if it can't connect to the rest of the body it dies yeah but it just wants to fucking be connected and that tourniquet might look like a rolex yeah dog you know like you may be putting rolex tourniquets on all your hands and numbing yourself out yeah man you know and that's i think the the tragedy of the the story of the ordinary world yeah so anyways i go in there though and yeah day one please day (laughs) one you know before we jump too far ahead day one you know the the first i have a really deep meditation on day one which was great um i think i was really ready for it yeah and the blackness is just such a beautiful technology it's like it's luxurious it's beautiful i even had the word i wasn't even sure what this word meant and sometimes i would get words in my head and i was like wow the blackness is obsequious 
Mm. I was like, obsequious? I don't think I'd even really know what that means. <laughs> but that means like really attentive. It would mm. be like there's an obsequious waiter who's just constantly providing you with what you need. It's just so rich and abundant that it's just the it's such a great teacher. Yeah. And it's so full. Like we think of black as the absence of things. Black is the everything. It's all of the things. And that's just the way that you look at it. And it became really clear in these early meditations, like if you have the most blinding white light and you have the deepest, darkest black, mm. they're the same thing. You see nothing. It's just the one. You're back to the one at that point. So yeah. whether it's everything, all the light, or nothing, all the black, you know, it's all the same everything yeah. nothing it's all it's just a matter of perspective you know and so within the black is everything and you know so many people came and, and i appreciate their well wishes there was so many people <laughs> saying sending you light sending you light <laughs> and i was like <laughs> no dog. i appreciate that but send me the send me darkness and it's just as much it's just as beautiful it's just a matter of your perspective still god and i remember seeing an upside down heart and and there was a it was so it's the other way it's upside down heart and it just reminded me that black is just another way to look at you know the manifestations and articulations of love in the universe it's just the other way of looking at it so we think light equals love equals mm. you know divinity yeah black equals you know chaos equals love equals divinity it's all it's all the same it's just about our perspective and I think as I started to unravel this more and more, you start to just recognize, and plant medicine does a great job of this too. For sure. And Ram Dass's teachings have been a huge guide in this, but just learning to really love and appreciate all aspects of the cosmic dance. Yeah, and I think that it's a reflection of the ordinary world that most of us have this implicit assumption that God is half and God is the light and then whatever the opposite of God is, is this other half, and that that's the darkness. And it's been so embedded in us by Christianity that there's God and the devil. <clears throat> but, you know, what plant medicines will show you and what the darkness showed you is it's like an Ouroboros. Yeah. And the, as you go around, you come back, and it's all, all God. Yeah. That's the truth. That's the truth. It was interesting, you know, when I went back, I I, I had a lot of visions, and it was interesting for me to see that some of my visions started on day one mm. and they were just in the depth of my meditation yeah and they weren't the fractal kind of visions but you know certain times things come to me in deep meditations and i think between at that point the ohm box was really working kind of mm -hmm. helping me put into trance i was doing a lot of the breathing techniques i went really deep with some breath work and you know so th that was that was kind of the first moment where I started to have a really some really profound visions, and that was one that I think I've shared with most people, you know, just in person. Was that was actually when I had my vision of Buddha, mm. and that was because I was really I was really in even I was really in a somber place. Yeah, when I went in there, like I wasn't happy, and I haven't been happy for a long time. I found a moment of happiness, some moments of happiness in Poland, mm -hmm. just being around my friends and brothers. And I remember sitting around at the dinner table after one of our crazy adventures and I was just, I actually started to just by myself just tear up. And like someone, I think Matthew Hussey, you know, she's like, what's going on, mate? And I was like, I'm just fucking happy, man. Like, I'm really just happy. And that yeah. like that happiness was such a contrast to my life um, before that it was, it was profound. Yeah. You know, because because I'll burst into moments of laughter or different things, but for the most part, I'm pretty I'm a pretty somber kind of fellow, you know, which is su probably surprising to most. But it's just yeah. that's kind of my normal state, unless I intoxicate my way out of it or find yeah. some other solution to kind of get me to the other side. And I wouldn't it wouldn't go so far to say that I'm depressed. I think a lot of those depressions I've been able to kind of work through, but mm -hmm. it's just kind of like pretty pretty low energy and pretty kind of down and in the darkness there's nothing that you're putting on for anybody mm. so i just really let myself i was just i yeah. just was what i was in there so anyways i see buddha and buddha comes as this shining like golden golden light figure and is 
and I just recognized it as Buddha, and I and Buddha was smiling so big, and I'm all somber, <laughs> and I say, Buddha, why are you smiling? And Buddha says to me in my own mind's eye, goes, why aren't you smiling? <laughs> and that actually made me smile a little bit, and then Buddha started laughing. I said, Buddha, why are you laughing? And Buddha says, why aren't you laughing? And I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I get it. There was like, and there was nothing else to say. Right. I always like, whenever I encounter a being like that, I always think like, I should have asked some more interesting <laughs> shit, you know? Like I should have fucking really come out with some some questions, like mm-hmm. a notepad, but you know, that's the Buddha nature. You know, the Buddha nature is like the release of your all your, your attachments. So of yeah. course you're smiling. And I think a reflection of it is you've done enough work where you already know that you know and there's a pretending that you don't know and that when you're in that space and it's just you and the beings coming through your psyche they know that you know and so a lot doesn't need to be said yeah yeah a lot of those encounters were really short and it was but it was beautiful i mean it was something that something that's impactful you know knowing that if i had a little buddha that i could hang out with and every time i'm taking shit too seriously you know buddha would be there to be like smiling and i'd look and be like why aren't you smiling <laughs> like I don't know my own delusions, my own shit, my own attachments yeah. to this thing that's important now, but it's going to be trivial in fucking 20 minutes or 20 days or 20 years, whatever. It's still in the, in the span of time, it's going to be trivial, yeah, but I'm but still caught up in it for now. And the truth is that you do have that. Yeah. A Buddha's here now. I know. What were the other visions that came to you on day one? There was just interesting visions of, you know, different kind of landscapes and different kind of worlds but there wasn't anything that particularly stood out like I listened to my recordings and I was I think I went into the such a deep theta that it was crossing that threshold of dream and awake right, yeah and those are those are the hardest ones to remember mm, because yeah. my my mental recorder is not like on for sure full blast yeah you know like an easier dream to remember like when you're in that kind of what feels like a gamma you know brainwave where you're like hyperactive Mm -hmm. and but still in the calm or alpha and things like that it's easier to remember what you're experiencing but in the theta it was like i basically was just in my recorder like wow that was a long deep meditation i don't remember that much but i remember but i but i remember feeling like it was a preview of what was to come Mm. You know, but it was it was kind of like blinded from me and maybe even for a reason. And that's one of the interesting thing about dreams is that I often have dreams where I don't remember what the dream was, but the feeling that I felt it was trying to convey is super clear and that I actually don't have to remember the dream. And so it yeah. feels like the vision was like, you know, it's coming and it's coming. Buckle up. Yeah. Yeah, man. And then so then starting, you know, starting after that, after that good meditation, felt kind of refreshed and just started trying to figure out the room a little better and then but really the the overwhelming thing that I kind of started to realize is I started just chewing on a lot of these issues these little practical decisions and relationships that had struggle I would get in the process of these what I would call mental bation, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is just like going back and forth and just yeah. jerking off these thoughts mm-hmm. and like creating these hypothetical arguments and these hypothetical right. scenarios where I say this and they say this. Right. And I would just think about that and be like, how much have I done this yeah. my whole life? And interestingly, I, in Poland, I got to get really close with Mike Posner. Mm-hmm. And uh, for whatever reason, he was the voice I heard the most in the first few days of the journey and i would get in one of these things and i would just hear his voice in my head and he would go bro honestly it's not that important yeah i'd be like yeah man you're right yeah but i started to like catch myself in that and that carried on through day two like day two you know there was the meditation wasn't as deep so it was really just me and my psyche and it was fucking ugly 
Yeah. It was just ugly. I'm just going through this thing and this thing. I think at some point I decided that I needed to sell all my houses. And at some point I decided <laughs> I needed to like move everything and like get, like get out of like, I needed to get rid of everything. And all my things were external. Like I got to do this and do this and do this and do this. And I was figuring all this shit out and like, oh, maybe not. I don't know. Like I got to get rid of all these relationships and blah, blah, blah. And it was like me just kind of going in this mental tirade trying yeah. to fix what I was feeling internally, externally. But really, you know, ultimately what I ended up realizing is that everything that I needed to fix was internally and that my life was actually fucking awesome. Yeah. But I wasn't there yet. I was just like, I need to do this and I need to do this and I need to do this and I and I need to do this. And it was all so serious and also like dramatic and also kind of it was really, really interesting. And I had some like some interesting ideas that came out of that. Like I had this idea of you know, the benefit of everybody having like a public confessional Mm. where your deepest, darkest things that you hold in shame, you just share them and let people roast you for them. But that's okay. That's like your willingness to be martyred because you're giving freedom and permission for the next person to do it. And then the next person who does it is like, here's all my shit. Here's the porn that I watch. Here's the thoughts that I have. Here's the negative things that have run through my mind. Here's the here's the drugs that i've taken here's the things that i've done like here it all is yeah and like the liberation that would come from that was like really interesting so it wasn't like all of it was wasted but man a lot of it was wasted yeah a couple of things that come up is so everything in our life that we make a subconscious or conscious agreement to ourselves that we want to change it becomes an open loop is what cognitive psychologists call it And it's like you're opening a tab on the browser of your consciousness. And the average person has like 150. The average CEO has about 500. And when you remove all stimulus, your brain starts to go through the tabs. And you have hundreds. And the really interesting thing for me is I'm starting to get to the point where I'm starting to feel overwhelmed by the amount of things that I'm saying yes to. And when it comes to relationships, like... I almost never think out having a conversation with someone anymore because the one decision that I've made like a spiritual commitment to that removes the 10,000 decisions of trying to think about how a conversation will go is, do I have the awareness to hear my truth in the moment? If yes, speak it. Done. And like a lot of people talk about like when they take a shower, they'll think about an argument with someone or that when they're going on a walk or when they're going to sleep, they think about how they're going to work through a discussion. That does not happen to me. And it's because I've made the commitment to that one thing. And it's just like, I release the egoic expectation of trying to control what this will be. I probably have a unrational or irrational belief in the God thing that if I just say my truth, whatever, whatever. And it closes like 200 tabs. Or the most highly rational. And that's what I was really wrestling with is because I do that so much. And it's such a fucking colossal waste of time because it just puts me in these, puts me in these anxious states. You know, one thing you learn in the dark is you have to do everything very intentionally and everything's very slow, but it's not Zen slow where you're like doing things effortlessly and perfectly. Like imagine a Zen tea ceremony where you're grabbing the glass and like, it's like everything is like this effort it's clumsy slow you still are moving slow but you're feeling around and you're getting your fingers in the avocado and you're like (laughs) screwing it it's not like but you have to do it intentionally otherwise you just make a mess of things yeah you know in that in that kind of way um but you know that that idea of just going through all of these different other things just just ends up ends up like putting you in a state so when i was in these like mental arguments hypothetical mental arguments with people who i had unresolved issues with i remember that was the first time that i caught myself eating and i was eating so unconsciously Mm. it's just like 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 just ravenously going through this bowl of food as fast as i could which 
look, you don't have a lot of shit to do in there. Like, what a waste. That, and not only was I in a, putting myself in a negative state where I was antsy and aggravated because of this completely fictitious argument that I was having, where someone was compl- saying completely made up things to For me. Sure. And I was coming up with my own re- ref- refutations mm. to their made up things, which I probably wouldn't even have the balls to say in the first <laughs> place, even if they did say that, yeah. right? And I found myself eating in this way and i was like and then i like bit my lip and i was like come on man oh wow slow down yeah like slow down see what's happening here like none of this is good you know like take your time with your food this argument isn't real you know like just calm yourself down so that second day was so much just trying to calm myself down and i started to develop like rituals Mm. that would help calm me down so uh, I was taught by Bharati. There's the fi- this, they use the different fingers to denote the five elements. Thumb is earth. Pointer finger is fire. Middle finger is ether or spirit. Ring finger is water. And little finger is air. Mm. So I was like, all right, well, look, I'm going to do something that represents all five of these elements. So for earth, you know, I'm going to exercise my body. I had a myofascial ball in there. I was going to do yoga. Sometimes I would just shake. I would just yeah. move around. I'm going to do something to keep my body moving because I'm confined to this small room and I want to like keep moving and not like atrophy. And so I was trying to do something like that. Um, fire, I decided was instead of actual literal fire, I decided I was going to make it about the divine fire of my own love, my own self love. So I took these. Uh, Rudraksha beads and there's 55 of them total one of which is the guru bead which is the one that has the little sprout of yarn at the end and I would go around and I would do Kamal Ravakant's I love you breaths Mm. so I love myself so I love myself breathe out anything that wasn't and then I would move from bead to bead and I would go through 54 of those which would take a while and then when I would get to the guru bead the 55th bead that's when I would do something from Joe Dispenza or something that we did at the Fit for Service Fellowship with Maya where I was grateful for an outcome that hasn't happened yet, Mm. which is calling from the, in in Joe Dispenza's language, calling from the quantum realm of possibilities and magnetizing it by your emotional state. What Jesus would say, pray as if it has already been done. Mm. So creating the reality where my body felt like what I was looking for had already happened. Yeah. So I would be grateful, like, oh, I'm just so grateful that I'm out of here and I'm sharing this story and mm. it's reaching people and it's all oh, so thankful for that and it's, it just feels so good. So maybe it would be that or maybe it would be something with my health or maybe it would be something with, oh, I'm so glad that this situation resolved in just the perfect way. Yeah. And, you know, so I would go to that. But it would take me all the way around the 54 beads, which was also helpful as well. Yeah. And then I would get to that. And that's a practice that I've continued and want to, and want to continue as well because um, it was really helpful along that. So that was fire. And then uh, ether or spirit, and that was the next one. And those were my meditations. And so that was me actually meditating long enough that I could actually form that connection to source. Water was me taking cold showers mm. which now you know after being in poland <laughs> like, shit. now it's like not a big deal yeah you know and uh and then that felt really good that was like a refreshing thing i suppose i could have done something with the hot too but i just didn't have opportunity to do anything with the hot um hot water or cold water so i was just using the cold water and then air was my breath work practice mm. yeah. and that's breathing in deeply putting like a bolster on your mid back so you can really expand your lungs belly chest head in in the full wim hof style breathing 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 until you feel the tingles exhaling not all the way but he calls it one atmosphere (sighs) just to hear and then it's not all the way to here (laughs) so exhaling one atmosphere and then holding your breath yeah and you know he's found that that's the best way to reduce inflammation and i was still a little fucked up from my travels to poland so reducing inflammation was huge so i'd go for a couple rounds of that hold my breath and interestingly in the breath holds i would start to get the first kind of glimpses of the flashes of light Mm. that would ultimately become overwhelming interesting so day two it was my rituals my and and that's expressed by namashivaya those are the five different Mm. elements that i was explained by Bharati, anyways and um of earth fire ether water air 
And I was like, all right, I'll make my way through these things. I'll eat. I'll do these different things. But for the most part, I was just fucking wrestling with myself. Yeah. And visions were very limited in day two. And so what comes up for me in that is that stage five. That's the tests and the allies. Stage and the six. Tests. Yeah. And those were coming at you. And, you know, the mental bation, as you call it, uh, <clears throat> were the first tests and the allies were the ritual that yep. you developed yep. in the face of that test. Yep. No doubt. No doubt. Okay, so day three, uh, and I'm also sleeping pretty good day one and day two. So, so that idea that the melatonin starts to produce, mm. I think is a, I think is a real thing because I was sleeping really well, falling yeah. asleep, going back to sleep. And that's not a normal pattern for that's you. That's not. I'm. A, I'm not. It's not easy for me to sleep. Yeah. So that was something that was definitely unusual. So um, day three starts, and day three starts to get considerably harder. Yeah. Because day three, that's when it really started to test me whether, and I really started to question my why. Like, mm. why the fuck am I doing this? Because I'm just stuck in my mind. I'm wrestling with these different things. I have ways to escape. But the idea that all I would have to do is open the window and take my mindfold off, mm. and I would get to see the beautiful outside. Or I could just tell them that I was done, and I could go on jogs every day through the black forest, and I could go back into the meditations and, and just use the blackness to meditate, and, and I could just you know stay there for the week but like and unplug, but I didn't have to do the darkness. Yeah. So I'd start all of this negotiation with myself. Whoa like constant negotiation with myself and that made things so much fucking worse yeah you know because i realized i didn't i didn't know my why really i was called to this i showed up and then but i still i still hadn't gotten to the point where i knew my why but i just kept hearing this voice like have patience have patience and i ended up having i think a turning point that day is i had i was you know let it had my mind fold on and i was breathing the fresh air the other part about it too is the air outside the window smelled so sweet mm. and i've smelled it before here in austin and different places but i swear every day it was like the ozone layer went all the way down to earth and i was breathing pure o3 air that was like informed by spring brooks and like <laughs> you know giant pines and it was like the most beautifully fragrant air i've ever smelled in my yeah. life and i'm just smelling that and going like god i want to be outside mm. you know and there was an awning so i couldn't feel any sun or anything like that but i could just hear the outside and i could smell the air and i actually i actually you know and i was still wrestling with the idea of like maybe i should just fucking call it and just go outside and do this i actually uh, had an encounter with my grandma and grandpa then on day three on day three and i never actually got to meet my grandpa aubrey mm. um but oh, he's wow. come to me in visions like once or twice before and they're both there and grandpa aubrey always has a big smile and and grandma you know grandma was there and grandma was like oh i'm so proud for you i'm so proud of you i love you so much and like you're doing it you're really doing it i was like thanks grandma you know and, and then aubrey was there and he was he was kind of echoing the same sentiment mm. and i go i just don't know why i'm here and then my grandpa aubrey goes you're here for the darkness son and i was like yep <laughs> all right grandpa like, yeah like that's that was enough and like that was enough to to kind of end that first round of the resistance that came from that and just beautiful that i got to even have that encounter imaginative or astrally real whatever you know people are comfortable with but to have that encounter with my grandma and my grandpa and that yeah. was another one of the interesting kind of visions that came early yeah the thing that comes up for me there is that one of the classic things that you find in all the hero myths is that the moment the hero is closest to giving up that's when the guide the mentor shows up mm -hmm. and like one of the most beautiful things to think about here is that the gift of being able to see your grandfather came from the fact that you put yourself in a situation where you almost gave up yeah you know that when you put the psyche through initiation rituals it like it activates <clears throat> this part where the guides are sleeping like the guides are in us right now but they don't have to be stirred because we're not in a acute stressor but you put yourself in the darkness and you had the temptation of just fucking 
you could just move your hand four inches and end the whole fucking thing. Yep. And because it was so close, it, it like it activates a part of the psyche that's not the ego. That's like, no. Yeah. You can do this. Yeah. It really made clear like, you know, that concept too of when you know your why, you can bear almost any how. Yep. Right? Nietzsche. Yeah. And, and then, so I really had to start questioning my why. Like, why am I doing this? And it was somewhat obscured to me. Yeah. You know, and I started to really meditate on the selfishness of my existence, you know, to Whoa. a certain degree. Like, that's really st what started to come up because, like, well, why am I doing this? This is uncomfortable. I don't like it. Am I doing this for me to be more comfortable? Well, mm. I don't know if there's that payoff. I'm not sure about that. I know I could be a hell of a lot more comfortable now, you know? So, like, I, that's, that's unclear. Or am I doing this for the ability to share this story, you know, and the ability to, like, express what I learned? And I was like, yeah, maybe that. But what's the motivation behind that? Am I sharing it with people because I actually love people and I want them to benefit from it? Mm. Or do I just like having something to share because yeah. that puts me in a position where I get, you know, the adoration of people who've done this? And so I started to really like meditate on that and be like, fuck, like the selfishness runs deep. Yeah. You know, it's like back when I w did ayahuasca and, you know, and the dragon came and the dragon was like, do you want power? And I said, yes. And the dragon says, why? And I said, to help people. And then the dragon showed me all of the ways in which I'd used power that did actually help people, but how I also gained from it as well. So it kind of like just pulled apart this idea of the completely selfless act, yeah, you know, and also the strategy behind different things like, how you put out content. Well, you choose content that is going to, you know, fit the algorithms that are going to actually reach the most people. So there is some strategy at play, but mm. if you're using strategy, are you doing it in a selfish way or a selfish way? Well, yeah. it's reaching more people, which is causing more good, but it's also giving you more feedback. So I got like stuck in this kind of deep meditation, which then eroded my why, mm. because as my ego started to soften, you know, the idea of like more people liking my stuff or me making more money, I was like, I don't fucking care. Like, what do I miss? I miss music and like hugging my friends. Like, I don't give a shit about yeah. this other stuff. I don't need to prove anything, you know? So, so then it really came down to like, it's got to be about, it's got to be about service. Like it has to be, yeah. but I wasn't, to be honest, I just wasn't fully there yet. I was somewhere caught between serving my ego and serving other people, but neither one was strong enough to be a compelling why. Yeah. You know, it was like, both were like, yes, I do want to help people. Yes, I do want to serve myself. But neither one was quite strong enough because I didn't love other people enough. And my ego you know, I'd already seen through the Maya, the illusion of my ego, which says that more is better. Yeah. You know, so like, it was just this kind of like weird middle ground, which I think made it really, really hard. Because without that strong why. But then I also realized that, you know, one of the things, and actually, again, it was Mike Posner, who was, I was like communicating with, oddly enough, through this whole journey. But he's like, look, man, you make these deals with yourself, so you learn to trust yourself. Mm and amen and like it almost it doesn't matter what it is but every time you go back on something that you promised to yourself that you're going to do you trust yourself less yes and that has that has a real effect yes so that was this kind of thing like okay yeah like i gotta trust myself if i say i'm gonna do this shit i gotta do it because yes. i'm so squirmy and wiggly <laughs> and i can justify yep. a million things and i can figure my way out of almost anything the smarter you are the easier it is for you to talk yourself out of the agreements that you make with yourself yeah yeah man <clears throat> and what I really think is going on in psychedelic experiences is you're basically being confronted with how you truly feel about yourself. And if you think that you deserve to be punished or that you deserve to go through hell, you get it. If you truly know that you honor your commitments and your truths, you get rewarded. 
And it's almost just like your psyche is showing you, this is how you feel about yourself mm. based off of, and I think you hit it on the head. I think it's one of the most important things that we can share with people is <clears throat> a lot of your life and the grace or the lack of grace that you have in your life comes from whether or not you trust yourself in the agreements that you make with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Truth. Truth. And I didn't really trust myself that much. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I'd seen myself wiggle out of a lot of different things. I'd done the things that I needed to do. And so I had some trust, but also when it was all about me, when I'm doing something totally for me and nobody else is holding me accountable, because like I'm there in the dark. I mean, and I did some shit in Poland too that was also pretty, pretty, you know, deep and pretty committed. But fuck, I had 12 really good friends there. Yeah, to hold you to accountable. To hold me accountable. Yeah. And darkness is just me. Mm-hmm. I could just take that blindfold and I could just tilt that bitch up. Yep. You know, and there was nobody else there to kind of, to stop me from doing that. So that was the real, you know, that was a real, real challenge. It feels like a big moment to recognize. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And that was, you know, that night, finally, um, that night, finally, I started to get the beginnings of some visionary, some visionary states. And it starts with like a pulsing in your eyes. It's like a pulsing of light Mm -hmm. and just some of the fractal, fractal stuff that starts to, that starts to come. And my sleep deteriorated pretty significantly. And I was yeah. wearing my aura ring. So I kind of figured that figured that out. But day three was day three was a hard day. A few moments in there, you know, a few moments where I had a few chuckles, which were the first times, a few positive moments, but a lot of like a lot of it was pretty dark, pretty bleak, and pretty challenging, you know, day three. Um, day four comes and the morning hits and the early morning hours you know i think i'm waking up probably well before the roosters crow so it's still dark outside so and the visions start really coming yeah and the lights are flashing in my eyes and i remember you know some of my friend one of my friends from poland jesse itzler was like it's gonna be lit and he was just joking but like it really was lit like I had these lights just constantly pulsing and flashing in my eyes. And, and it was like, oh, shit. Because that's supposed to happen around day five. And I had it end of day three, start of day four. So it was happening before. That sounds like the breath work and the meditation got you there faster. Totally. Yeah. Totally. And also probably the history of work that I've done with oh, for plants sure. and all of that. Um, but it was exciting and unnerving. Because I felt like I had a new radio antenna and it was like tuned into this other world. But I was like, fuck, I still got a couple days of this left yeah. to go, you know? And, um, but I started to kind of tap in and get like more visions and more understandings. And it became, it became, you know, it started off pretty dark, not like in, in the color and the absence of light, but like demonic, like demonic, mm. you know, and like wow. gruesome. You know, and and it was a real practice of like accepting and trying not to judge and show preference to yeah. those things that were celestial and those things that were beautiful. Because the more I tried to fight those other 100%. images, like and and some of it, it would be like a, a wheat thresher just mowing over people, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, I don't want to fucking see this." Wow. But the more I said, "I don't want to see this." The longer I would be stuck in that loka of of experience, you know, that Dram Dass calls it, yeah, Resi- or that, that which, which you resist, resist persists. Persist. So I was seeing a lot of this like kind of gruesome Kali imagery stuff, and I think that's where like there's some real deep wisdom in these kind of Hindu traditions. It's like Kali is wearing that necklace of severed arms and severed heads, and so I got this. Yeah, and it's it's like that's part of it. You know, Shiva destroys, Brahman creates. You know, it's this part. And it's just about us releasing our preference. Yeah. And finding the beauty in the destruction as well as in the in the creation. So really kind of working with a lot of that um was kind of a key part. And then finally, like kind of work through that. And I started to break through that after I finally really accepted that into some lighter imagery, into yeah. some like kind of love and more celestial kind of explorations and started to have some really interesting like really interesting kind of understandings come in i think the first one was like i said sometimes words would get stuck in my head Mm -hmm. 
and the word a perspectival got stuck in my head i was like this word i can't stop saying this word yeah and so i wonder what what this is trying to teach me and i was like what is a perspectival what is it in the absence of perspective i was thinking the soul i was like no because the soul has its own lifetimes and it has its own container well the only thing that's truly a perspectival is nothing or everything omniperspectival or actually a perspectival same thing so the only thing that's actually a perspectival is the divine is source is the one is god and then so i was recognizing that okay so if i was going to define what god is then i would call it the loving a perspectival witness law and i was like it was curious to me i was like oh god's law yeah. the loving a perspectival witness and i realized like if you keep playing the witness game so there's me the one playing aubrey and then there's the witness of the one playing aubrey and then there's the witness of the witness of the one playing aubrey and the witness of the witness of the witness of the one playing aubrey and if you keep going to that you eventually get to the witness that witnesses all from no perspective it's like hermes trismegistus's quote you know, God is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere, but whose circumference is nowhere. Mm. Center is everywhere, circumference is nowhere. A perspectival, right? It takes it's, me back to an ayahuasca vision. That, yeah, I didn't know he said that quote. That's amazing. That's an amazing quote, right? I mean, like, you start to realize that. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's God then. And so like things downloads started to come yeah. and I have 13 pages of downloads and there's no way I can even remember them because I did them on a voice recorder and, and put them in. But these are some of definitely the, the big ones. And then I started to work on, a, on my own kind of guiding mantra for myself. You know, Maharaji told Ram Das, love everybody, tell the truth. And I played with that one. And I was like, you know, maybe eventually I'll adopt that as my own. But really what seemed to make the most sense to me was love yourself, be honest. Yeah. Because yourself is a representation of everyone and everything. From that does the other. From that does the other. And so, you know, like Rumi says, we are not a drop in the ocean. We are the ocean in a drop. If we're able to totally love ourselves we're able to totally love everything so yeah. love yourself and that's a great place to start right because we'll love because we judge ourselves more than we judge any other aspect of anything typically so love yourself and then be honest because tell the truth is a different thing because telling it the idea is mm. is an expression of truth that is verbalized you know and, and it still works but be honest to me was just a little bit different it's it's more humble. It's like because you know, it's not claiming that you have the ability to articulate the truth, but that right. the best that you can do is to be honest, be honest with where you are. I'm feeling this, right? And it's not claiming everything. Anything is a fact. It's really it's interesting. Just like, yeah, it's just like this is what I'm feeling. Hmm. This is what I'm thinking. Man, I'm fucking wicked jealous right yeah. now. Like I'm just feeling this thing, you know. And it's and not trying to project and claim and try to. But just really be honest. Be honest with yourself first and foremost, and then be honest with anybody else yeah. that you're communicating with. That's really, so love yourself and be honest. I really like that because there's lots of spiritual people that I've witnessed who will use this intention to speak the truth to claim truth for another person at them. And it's like, if you want to destroy a conversation, tell the other person what their truth is. It's not how that works. But if you're being honest, you can yeah. admit this is what I'm feeling. This is the story I'm telling about what I think you're doing. And then you can actually talk about it. And I think that that's a really great, <clears throat> love yourself and be honest feels like you've articulated where you start. Mm -hmm. The end goal is love everyone, tell the truth. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely the, the spot for me that made, that yeah. made the most sense. And, you know, I, I started to explore different other, kind of relationship and i might be confusing day four and five here but i'll try I and keep you. it i'll try and keep it roughly together but i started coming up with acronyms mm -hmm. you know for interesting things um and some of it was just guides to relationships so if you're in a relationship you know your goal should be to be loving aware respectful and kind right so 
loving. Obviously, that's the easiest one to remember. That means to be open to love, to be generous with your love, and to graciously receive it, not to block it off. Because I started to become aware that I've been blocking off love. I started to think of myself like, I've been like a fucking action an action hero in a movie like a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie called Hard to Love. <laughs> and that was Chris Marcus, Aubrey Marcus. That was me my whole life, hard to love because I wouldn't fully let it in. And not even my mom who like loved me un- as unconditionally as any human being could. I just never really fucking fully let it in. And to plant a flag here, you would say that this is approach to the inmost cave is starting to recognize? It's starting to recognize this. Yeah, for sure. For sure. This is the approach seven. to the inmost cave, for sure. Um, and so that was it. So loving, aware, so keeping that person in mind. I think a lot of the times I've been deeply wounded. I've felt like, you know, Whitney or whatever lover wasn't aware of me. Mm. They were just like, ah, not even looking. So just be aware, you know, be aware of yourself, you know, things that you may be doing and be aware of the other person. Respectful and respectful means respectful of somebody's boundaries Mm. because we're caught as humans in between the boundlessness of God, which knows no boundary. Sure, take my life, take whatever. It's just an expression of me. I'm everything. Like it doesn't matter. Boundlessness. But we're humans. We have an ego and identity and a body and flesh that's permeable. So boundary is necessary, like a cactus that has spines or a rose that has thorns. So we're caught between the divinity of our nature and the boundary that is a necessity for being human 100 so to be in a relationship you have to respect not only your boundaries but your partner's boundaries yeah the thing that comes to mind is like a flashlight like in order for the light to come through it needs a container and if you destroy the container the light can't come through it anymore and exactly it, we need boundaries exactly yeah well, it's, it's an absolute necessity and any boundary that you don't put out externally you'll create internally Right. And then that internal, and I started to really recognize this actually the next morning when I had a lot of anger come up. Yeah. And I realized that I hadn't put out enough external boundaries. So what I did instead is I created internal boundaries. And those internal boundaries kept me from loving and receiving love from another person because I was worried about them trampling on my feelings. But if I didn't love them, it didn't fucking matter anyways. So the failure to create these external boundaries doesn't actually work because you create internal boundaries, which are trickier and harder to remove. Yeah. You know, whereas if lovingly you create external boundaries and say, look, it just doesn't make, you know, it, it's not in the right accord for me to spend time with you right now. I love you as you are, but, you know it doesn't really make sense to do this and, and this we'd be better off spending time apart or I'm not really feeling this or whatever the, whatever the thing is. And this is so hard. It, like this is one of the things I struggle with the most and something that I see people who want to claim the story that they're spiritual is there's this story of because I'm spiritual, I can endure anything. Right. I can handle anything. So and they that's don't. spiritual bypass. Yeah. <laughs> but what they're going to end up doing is creating fucking internal boundaries. Yep. And those internal boundaries are going to keep them from love and they're going to build resentment. And yeah. eventually that fucking lid's going to come off, which happened to me a million times. Those are all my yeah. angry outbursts, which when I have these angry outbursts, then I'm shameful about the angry outbursts. Then I <laughs> repress those things more and then they dive even deeper. Yeah, and it's one of the, and this is, this came up for me watching the video, and I know that we'll get to this point, but one of the things that has been coming up for me lately is this Buddhist idea of not having attachment. I think how a lot of people will try to implement that is to not actually allow themselves to deeply connect to life, to people, to love. And they think that that's them being in their Buddha nature of not having attachment. But what it seems to be is that if you actually allow yourself to connect deeply to your life, you are promised grief on the other end. And then to also experience that deeply and that that's the non-attachment. It's not resisting either of them being, but to just fucking rip your heart open. Like who's who's that monkey God that has his- Hanuman. Yeah. Like that feels like that's the way as opposed to, and I'm so guilty of this, of this like, I've- I've read quotes about Buddha. I'm not attached, AKA, I haven't let myself open up to you at all, so you can't hurt me. And I'm enlightened. Yeah. And it's full of shit. And that was, that was the ordeal. So the approach to the inmost cave was kind of figuring all this stuff out, sorting out different aspects of myself, figuring out boundary and relationship. And, and I ended up realizing like the, the really, this idea of changing people is also a misguided idea. Guilty. It, because, all the thing that you can do and paul selling talks about this but i never really got it 
the only thing we can really give someone is to love love them as they are yeah, man. to love what is and i was constantly in this trap of loving people for the potential of what they could I'm the be the same way dude. which is judgment yeah and that judgment is going to be internalized by them <laughs> and that judgment is going to make them have less self-love for where they are which is going to drive them further into their distractive and other mechanisms of protection so even though we think that we're helping them reach their potential we're showing them that we love them if they reach that potential which is making them ashamed and afraid of the potential that they're currently in and we're actually being counterproductive and i've done that with every girl i've ever been with in my life same same and it's that was like it's so insidious because you think that you're being the loving son but really what you're doing is not consciously and not purposely but you're putting fear and guilt and shame out and you're calling it love yeah dude i have been there yeah and you know when i saw when i saw whitney and i've probably done this with nobody worse than whitney and i saw whitney and i finally got to see her like faces some faces were easy some faces were hard it depends on how much static and friction i had i think in seeing somebody i finally see her she has this crown of eagle feathers on her forehead so i've always wanted to reach whitney to reach her spiritual potential you know and i've loved that idea of her spiritual potential her tapping to the divine feminine and i saw her looking out and i was like yes and then i saw her looking down at herself looking down at herself and what she was saying was am i doing it right (laughs) am i doing it right (laughs) and i was looking at her and i was like fuck yeah man like that's maybe i didn't create that but i i exacerbated that because i would use my love for when i thought you were doing it right oh you went on this ayahuasca journey it's so great baby Oh, I'm so happy for you. Oh, yeah. And all it does is, am I doing it right? Am I doing it right? Yeah, and that's man. not going to get anybody to do anything. You know, that's just going to that's just gonna make her want to avoid looking at who she really is, yeah. which is going to give her the love, which is going to be the baseline and the foundation <sighs> for her to actually become that thing, which I've seen. But it's what Paul Selig says. You don't actually take anybody and do anything with them. You just see them and love them as they are and if it's their truth they'll become it they'll if and it's the only way it's the only way for them to choose it you can't drag people hand in hand up the mountain yeah they have to climb i can't push somebody in a fucking bucket of ice and they'll have a wim hof experience i can't hold somebody in the darkness in a cell all they're going to be thinking about is how much they resent me for putting them in the darkness. You got to yeah. walk yourself in the darkness. Yeah. You got to go into the cold yourself. You got to go through, you got to climb these mountains on your own. And the way to support someone is to love them no matter what. Yeah. You know, like my friend Humble, the poet who's at in Poland, you know, like he doesn't know how to swim. And the very first day, he had the courage to jump into an icy waterfall into a pool and he was just going to figure it out but if someone pushed him in yeah man that wouldn't have worked he wouldn't have had that courage and then another day he didn't want to do that and i told him look man you don't have to do that you got nothing to prove brother like you're worthy of there's no reason to be hard on yourself yeah just love yourself and whichever decision you make is perfect decision and it's easier with guys like that right for sure because we don't have the same we don't have attached we're not attached we're not like hoping that they become something because we don't like whether humble did that or not i don't it's up to him man it's right, up you to don't you. care it's up to you, you just love him period yeah exactly like i love you either way like we're gonna go back to that little house in poland we're gonna eat some amazing food from chef kamu and it's all gonna be good no matter what i'm not gonna think any less of you because you didn't jump in this fucking freezing waterfall for the yeah. second time in the middle of the night with these tiki torches up like i don't care you know but with our partners and the people we're invested in and attached right. to that's when it gets hard so like i had that i had that realization and and just like my my purpose is to love people as they are yeah and that started to give me like a real understanding of my purpose and it's a dangerous thing because any analysis even 
any analysis contains some contains some judgment to a certain degree. It's very difficult to observe and witness and and share, but share it without attachment and share it with full love. Yeah. The most important thing is that the love doesn't change. And I think it is valuable to share what we see. Right. But share it as something that we see, something that we're unattached to, and share it when they're ready to receive it. You know, like, you know, hey, I'm I'm just I'm not seeing this. And they're like, okay, well this is what I see. Yeah. But this is your journey. It's like whispering to a flower where the sun is, but you have to let the flower reorient. You can't, because if you try to force it, you might break it. Exactly. You know, like you just have to whisper. Yeah. And that's what Ramdas says about the Maharaji, you know, who just, they're in a place where they understand that we're all just walking each other home to enlightenment. Yeah. It doesn't matter how many lifetimes it takes. It doesn't matter if it takes this lifetime or next lifetime. It's all of our attachments about time and this lifetime and this thing that we're doing that's causing us to push people and and be in a hurry where we're missing out on just the ability to love people as they are right now yeah and the thing that comes up for me that i haven't thought about until now but it seems to be some of the wisdom that's coming through your psyche as you went through this experience is that if you know yourself truly you can articulate your boundaries to your flashlight and then if you speak the truth with your partner you can quickly learn whether or not their truth fits your container. Yeah. And the quicker you can get to that knowing, the quicker you can let them go from your expectations mm. and you can simply love them as they are. And then you will eventually find the partner whose truth fits your container. And also it's about, you know, be open to changing your container because there's this force that's beyond the ego that brings people into your life that you fall in love with that if you let them love you and you let yourself love them they will transform the container of the flashlight a little bit Mm -hmm. but you have to recognize like i'm so guilty of this in my past relationships is that over changing the truth of my container because i want them to fit inside of my flashlight yep and those are those are When we have these desires, these desires trap us, these attachments trap us. When we want something from somebody, that's the reason why Maharaji was able to do that because he didn't want anything. Right. He didn't care. He was like free of his attachment as to whether someone gained any kind of spiritual enlightenment or not. He knew they were all getting there anyways, you know, because he was seeing from the aperspectival approach of this is just one of infinite worlds and locas of existence and it's all helping the soul learn and and it's fine but our attachment and our desires will cause us to adjust our boundaries and like adjust the way that we act adjust the things that we're trying to create outside of our truth outside of our truth so i came up with the other acronym h-e-b which is a funny grocery store that's here in, Mm -hmm. in in austin but it worked and it's honesty like radical honesty expectation management well first of all lark was the first one loving aware respectful kind kind is kind is actually one that i that i struggled with but i really understood that kindness is just there's a kind of dispassionate nature to being a perspectival Mm. it's like i don't care Mm. but kindness is sometimes like giving a little bit more of a hug giving a little bit more of a soft landing yeah you know just not not really not pushing yourself so pushing somebody so much into the radical truth by sharing the thing that you're just kind or maybe not doing the things that are going to be so super challenging that it's actually just kindness i think is a human thing respecting that the human body has tenderness and that we're not treating each other like oh you're just a soul machines machines yeah yeah. and then so that was that was to finish that that's lark and then lark is one bird a finch is another bird and the other part of uh the thing i thought about finches was instead of finches flinches like all of those things that create flinches Mm -hmm. i'm trying to like larks not flinches wow so like create something that's not you're not trying to create flinches which are protective Mm. mechanisms you know like do do your best to remove the flinches and the flinches come from something that's surprised imagine when you flinch in reality at someone giving you one of those and you and you flinch it's like something that you didn't expect. Mm-hmm. Well, you can avoid the flinching by just riding with the truth, riding with the truth. So there's no slap. There's no gap from when, from the truth that you're expressing. The boundaries are clearly expressed. Interesting. And there's no gap. So as larks, not flinches, and H-E-B. 
honesty, expectation management. And that was another one that I was like really going deep on is like the idea of expectation, which is like any expectation we have is completely ludicrous. And it just leads to disappointment because that's saying that I know better what should happen. I know better what should happen in the world than what the all, what the capital M mystery, what the uni- capital U universe knows. I know better. And if it doesn't meet that, well, it's wrong. Yeah. And there's something inherent about if you're in expectation, you are denying the truth of what is. Exactly. You're, you're hypothesizing that something should be different than what it is. Which when well, you take a moment to think about it, it is insanity. It's insanity. It is what it is. And you're saying, no, no, no. What is, isn't what should be. How, what hubris. And that's the ego taking the role and pretending to be God. I know best. And there what is, happened isn't what should, have, what should have happened. An interesting thing that comes up for me is I think you're only allowed to have expectations for yourself about what you feel you could be, but you don't get the right to have expectations over how other people are or what they should be. You can see what you feel is your intuition about what they could be, and that's whispering to the flower. And I do think a part of going on the hero's journey is that feeling that what is could be otherwise, but you only get to do that with you. And even then, it shouldn't be an expectation, it should be an intention, because Mm. otherwise we won't love yourself if it turns out differently, right? Like, my intention is this, Mm. but I don't have an expectation, what is, what is, is. If I wasn't, if I pulled my blindfold off, then what is, is, and I was, that's what was, you know, so the expectation that I was going to last six days or the expectation that I was going to be celibate for six months and it only turned out nine days, well, that was my intention, but I learned something along the way and what is, was, and what was, was, you know, and you just start to accept that. It's like a much deeper, you know, acceptance, which helps you love yourself and helps you love other people but yes you're right you can have intentions for yourself where you must be mindful of intentions for other people it's their prerogative to make the intentions for themselves and then the other one again like we've been talking about is boundary like you have to have firm boundaries and the more you move your boundaries around the less trustworthy you're going to be with yourself or they're going to be less trustworthy with you so honesty expectation management and boundary yeah so i started to like really learn those kind of like key elements it sounds like these were the treasures in the chest inside of the cave yeah and this was all leading up to this you know the approach to the inmost cave where i'm like starting to sort some like really important shit out here and then i started to have some more kind of loving celestial visions i started to see rainbows i started to you know the fractal patterns increased what was really interesting is, is i got to a place where finally that tension in my chest that i talk about it just released and I was in really deep peace and I could actually see like the demons in my mind. They were throwing confetti in the air. <laughs> it was like a big celebration. Wow. And I was just, and like my mind was like, you can take your blindfold off, man. Now you did it. You did it. And I was like, Oh fuck. I remember just wrestling with that again. Like maybe I did, maybe I'm done. Was there a specific vision or a thought that happened right before the release in your chest? I think it was the combination of, I saw, a couple of visions with the key relationships that I'd had struggle with. I also went through this whole thing about loving what is, and I felt like I found some deep truth. All of the stuff we've recently been talking about, those all came. And then I also had a really personal and powerful vision of my father. Mm. And, um, you know, in this vision of my father, he was in the corner of the room and, he was reading a book and my father's had mental illness for the last, you know, last eight years or so. And in that mental illness, um, he's heard voices that have told him that he was any variety, delusions of grandeur and, yeah. and that sort of thing. So messiahs, kings, whatever. I see my father in the corner of the room and there's a lamp and he's reading a book. And I say, um, hey, dad what book are you reading? And he says, the book of lies. And I said, dad, why are you reading the book of lies? And he says, well, it tells me all kinds of things I want to hear. It tells me I'm a king. It tells me I'm a Messiah. It tells me all these things. 
And he closes the book. He's like, but I'm reading the book of lies because I never thought I was enough. Because the truth was that I never loved myself and I was never enough. And then he throws the book over his shoulder and he says, son, no matter what, remember that you're enough. And remember that you're worthy of love and it's not about what you do and you don't have to be a king and you don't have to be a messiah and you don't have to be anything special. You're worthy of love just for being who you are. And it was like just such a powerful moment of my dad saying like, you know, this is why I turned to the book of lies. My psyche turned to the book of lies, but you never have to do this. And both me and my dad share this really strong internal judge. And I learned that from him to a certain degree. And I remember just saying like, dad, you know, just know that everything you did was perfect. Everything you did was perfect because look where I am now. Here I am, dad. Like you did it. You did it, you know? And I, and I, I don't know my ability to be able to share that with them in, in 3d reality, but, yeah. I, but just sharing that with them and knowing that I'm going to do my best, whether it's to write a letter or kind of find a way to reach him in whatever state that he's in to just say like, look, you know, what you did was perfect. And then I also told him that I would help with my little brother and help with my stepmom and, you know, some of the things he was worried about. So I had that big, profound vision. Yeah. So it felt like it felt like I'd reached the point where I'd broken through. Mm -hmm. And my mind was like, you're done, bitch. <laughs> you're out of here. Like, you did it. Congratulations. The reason the demons were throwing the confetti were like, we need to get him out of here right now <laughs> yeah, so exactly. we don't look at the real thing. Exactly, exactly. And uh, but I so I, I there's a 24 hour call button. So I hit the 24 hour call button and Barati comes in to talk to me. How you doing? I say, I think I'm done. I think I'm done. I think this is it, you know. And she's like, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you think about this? Come down to our little, you know, come down to our little singing session tonight. And if after the end of that, we'll do a little gong bath and we'll do a few things. And if after that you're done, you're done. That's fine. You know, but the mind is tricky. And she was mm. like. You know, the mind is tricky. And mm -hmm. sometimes it says you're done when you're not done. So just be sure. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Mentor. Yeah. And so I went through the rest of the, you know, went through that night. And I remember, you know, as soon as I made the decision to keep the blindfold on, all of that ease that was in my chest kind of contracted. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, fuck, I should have just taken my blindfold off. I should have just mm -hmm. stuck with what I was thinking. But I ended up through all the prayers and all the visions and all of the gongs and everything, I just started seeing so much more. Just my, my, the pulsing lights were increasing. The visionary state was increasing my access to seeing these huge geometric DMT fractal you know, beings and entities and all this was just going overload. And I was like, all right, I got more to do. It was like, I'm going to stay. And she's like, you can come out tomorrow if you want. I was like, you know what? I think I want to stay in here two more days, which would be six days. And I had some like kind of, um, you know, kind of like romantic ideas of, you know, seven days. And on the seventh day, they said, let there be light. Jesus, I was like, baby. Yeah, exactly. But I was like, fuck it. And I'm like, I'm at least two more, two more days. You know, I'm going to go through a full day. And I'm really glad I did because that night I didn't sleep much, maybe two and a half hours on the aura ring. And because the, the visions were so intense. And, um, I woke up and I, I had a dream with a lot of anger and I hadn't, exp I hadn't felt a lot of emotion, not a lot of tears. Some like when I had that vision with my dad and that vision with, with Whitney and, um, but anger really started to come up and that's when I really started to explore anger. And it was interesting cause I heard one of the kids, I think the three-year-old kid, um, three-year-old girl in the house and she had a, she had a fit. She just started mm, expressing her rage and like, rah, 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 like so angry. Before your anger or during After. your anger? So I'm angry in the morning. I'm like, wow, I'm angry. I'm fucking angry. And I started exploring that. I started feeling like, oh, but I'd repressed all of that anger. And if I was just like a kid who just yelled and screamed and got it all out, I probably wouldn't repress it. Mm. And I think so much of the repression of anger has been what's kind of kept me sad. Yeah you know, and like kept me kind of bottled up and kept me anxious was, and part of that is the, you know, not having healthy boundaries. That's exactly what was Allowing coming people to trample my yep. boundaries and then overreacting and mm -hmm. then being in this thing of like, and anger is bad because my dad used to be angry. So I learned that anger was bad and the way that I've used anger has been bad. So then anytime I feel anger come, instead of being like, okay, here's anger. This means that I've not let a boundary you know, I've let a boundary be Cross. transgressed. 
but then I'm also like bottling up this anger. So for the first part of day five, I was just processing anger and just really like deeply looking at anger. And I started doing a lot of shaking and like as close as I could to ecstatic dance in the silence. I couldn't even handle the own box by then. So it was yeah. just like fucking silence at that point. Um, I started to process that. And then that was probably took me all the way past lunch. And, and then that started to shift. I went into another meditation and with Whitney in particular, this was like the first crack where the emotion shifted from anger to sadness. And this was where like, I'm in the, I'm in the inmost cave at this point, right? Yeah. Like, so chapter eight of the hero's journey. And, and in that, all Whitney said was, I've always done my best. And it was fucking devastating, like such a simple thing. But then I realized that every grievance I've had against her, every judgment that I've made, it's all my own. She's always done her best and I've always done my best and my dad's always done their best and everybody's always done the best they could at any given moment. And for her to say like, I've always done my best and realize that everything that I've held against her was my own, it was devastating. And I just got to see a woman, a girl doing her best. And like that opened like this floodgate of tears and opened a pathway of like much deeper love. And I started going through different people. And then that's when I had a really strong connection with my mom. And I'm going through this meditation and I'm connecting with my mom. And my mom just said, you know, I've always loved you, son. I've always loved you so much. And I still love you so much. And recognizing then at that point that I never even let my mom really love me. Like never let her, never let that love like really fully in. That moment was the moment where I had probably the deepest catharsis. 20 minutes of just sobbing, recognizing that even the place where love was the safest and most assured and ever present, I never really let myself feel it. And I started to ask why, why? And really the answer was something that you alluded to earlier. If you let yourself feel how amazing it is to feel love, then you become attached to it. And then you know that you have to let it go. I'm going to have to let my mom go. She's in her 70s. I'm going to have to let her go. She's going to die. So if I don't really love her, eh, I'll be okay. And I'm going to have to let Whitney go. Every time she sees another guy or if our relationship, I got to let her go. But if I let her really love me and if I really love her, then I got to let her go. And like that hurts. That hurts when you really love. So yeah, I used to think like, yeah, I'm not afraid of dying. You know, a good way to not be afraid of dying, not love living. Got nothing to lose then. So I tricked myself. You know, I tricked myself into believing that I wasn't afraid of death and that I wasn't scared of my mom dying and I wasn't scared of losing Whitney and I wasn't scared of all of these things. Well, of course you weren't, dummy, because you didn't really enjoy them. You didn't really love your life. You didn't really love people. You didn't really love anything because I'd protected myself because the it was horrifying to think about having to let it all go if I really loved it. Yeah. Like that was, that was just too much to bear. But then you look at the other side of the coin, which is, okay, that may be terrifying, but imagine just the absolute horror of going through the entirety of your life and never loving it. Fuck. Like that is on another level of pain. And that's why I think it's so hard for people to come to these realizations because when I realized that I hadn't fully let love in and I hadn't loved my life, I'm 38 years old. I've spent so much of my life not really loving it. Imagine if I was 58 years old or 78 years old and then I had that realization. I'm like, fuck, my life is almost over. And I hadn't. At least I'm somewhere in the, you know, hopefully before the midpoint you know and i get to have this realization but still like the the understanding that i'd let so much of my life pass 
yeah. without really loving it was just devastating. And for the rest of that day, I would just break into sobs, just uncontrollable sobs. And that was the thing that really kind of cracked my heart open. And like, I realized how much I love my life and how much I missed my life. And I started to get worried. I was like, oh my God, I haven't been in touch with anybody. What if someone died while I was gone? Like, and I never got to love them. Like, what if? Like, what if I never got to really love them? You know, like, what if, what if something happened? You know, like, fuck. Like, I just want to get out and I just want to show people that, I, that I'm really there and I can really love them. And I want to really love them. I want to really have them know that I love them just as they are and I'll feel it. I'll take all their love. And I started to miss things. And it wasn't that I missed the sight of things. It's that I missed the essence of things. Yeah. It wasn't anything in isolation. I didn't miss looking at trees, looking at clouds. Looking. I missed the tree itself. I missed the person itself. Not just the touch, not just the smell, not just the, the essence of them. To be able to like dance with the essence of the beings and of the things. And even music, I was thinking about music. Well, music is just kind of singular. It's an oral transmission. But I'm like, but it's not really. Because music is eliciting the everything that's in me. It's the essence. It's the essence of me that's allowing it to flower. Same with great art. Great art, yes, it's purely visual, but it's the essence of the artist, but it's eliciting the all that's within me. The ocean that's in the drop of me. Yeah. And so that's why you miss it. It's the essence that comes from within you or comes from within something else. And it's that dance that that I miss so much. And so there was grappling with the inmost cave, which was the courage to love and be happy, knowing that it could all be taken away. Yeah, and the core thing that comes up for me when I hear that is <clears throat> your mom's love, that type of love from another human. The only way to actually accept it is to see the truth that they see, which is, is that you are inherently worthy of love. And so if you don't love yourself, that's a manifestation of you not allowing someone else's love in. Do you know what I'm saying? Because yep. like the mom's love for the child is so unconditional when it's in its light, which it truly yep. feels like your mom's is. <clears throat> and that if the way you deny it is by not loving yourself and that the fundamental core thing mm -hmm. there is you let their love in when you allow yourself to love yourself. That's the key. And that's why self-love is the foundation and is the foundational practice and why my mantra makes sense. Love yourself and be honest. You know, those two things, I just kept coming back to those two things. So that night progresses and I entered a place where I could only call, you know, soul land. Yeah. And in soul land, I had access to communication with everybody in a beautiful way. I could see the fractal patterns of these giant geometric shapes, which Bharati told me were actually the soul forms of people. And it was interesting, like some would be like these gigantic golf ball looking things. And, and, and to use that analogy, imagine every dimple of the golf ball was a door. And in those doors were little figures. And I was like, why do I keep seeing these with like these big geometric shapes with little doors? And I was like, oh, maybe those are all the incarnations, all the lives of that soul. Of that soul. And when all the doors are all full and all that soul, or maybe it expands, I don't know, man. I'm just exploring a, a, a foreign land. But I was like, but maybe when it fills, all of those fills, the soul's complete and it mm. doesn't need to take any more lives. Mm. And it was just this like really interesting understanding. And then communication started coming from different things, even patterns like the like I see spaceships in, in fractal patterns and I would talk to aliens. I saw images of different animals and they'd be different people. Shockingly, one of them was like Whitney's boyfriend. And I'm like, I'm really talking to Whitney's boyfriend right now. It's like the last on my list of people <laughs> who I'm intending to talk to, but I talked to him and it was a really beautiful conversation. Texted him when I got out and he's like, wow, man, that's like spot on. Cause I was like, I don't know if this is just my projection or imagination, but we had this chat I want to tell you what it was, just in case it's helpful. He's like, thank you so much. It was like really interesting, like what kind of started to transpire that night. But that night, late, after I was in Soul Land, and it was all kind of this beautiful, all of these encounters and all of these different interesting things that were happening, it was the darkness really started to break me because I feel like 
before that, the darkness didn't break me because I was already broken. I already didn't love my life so much that I didn't really miss the outside. Mm. I didn't miss my life. Mm. So the darkness put me back together, showed me that I did love my life. And then when it did love my life, that's when I... It really hard. It made... that's when the breaking happened and it was a beautiful breaking it was a breaking open but i never i didn't want to leave faster or more than (laughs) than ever before at that point because i wanted to get back to the life that i loved so end up getting another couple hours of sleep that night waking up the next day talking to barati and we both agreed that that was the day that's day six and we both agreed that that was the day at sunset so at sunset i would take my take my mask off and at some point i'll show people what transpired when i took my mask off which was probably the rawest most emotional reliefs i've ever seen where i started looking at the trees yeah i've never seen a human cry like that in my entire life i've never cried like that in my entire life it was absolutely overwhelming and it went on for a long 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 time and uh and i would still throughout the next subsequent days just burst into tears like that over anything i mean shit i was you know I would watch them. I watched Stranger Things three, and just seeing the kids, you know, like seeing the kids love each other and be friends, and seeing people be people. I'd be like, "Fuck, I love people," and I'd start sobbing because I know that I would watch that same thing and be like, oh, "Yeah, yeah, movie people, whatever." I would just see people and just like love people, you know. So interestingly you know so i took my blindfold off had that whole experience of just recognizing how much i appreciated life and love and then you know that was the seizing of the sword in the classic hero's journey the seizing of the sword was the sword the sword of unblinding and the unblinding comes from love it was seeing the kingdom as it really is you know and accessing the power to see the truth that was my sword but then the next phase the return home trickiest one whoa i had no respect for that phase because i feel like ayahuasca unbuttons the vest does some psychic surgery and then stitches you back up you still have stitches you got to be mindful you're a little fragile but you're stitched i was just shredded and like the i was just looking at my phone for a little while and i was like Do I open it? And yeah, I was like, all right, here we go. Yeah. You know, I made it through the darkness. I can definitely open my phone. Yeah. And the only thing that I could do, I could see the text start flooding in. And I just hit, you know, play on some music. And I listened to music first, listened to the Ram Dass East Forest album. And that was like, okay, step one is music. Wow, it's beautiful. All right, step two, take a peek at the messages. <laughs> you know, but everything was so, I had so much anxiety because I was just this like raw newborn you know, trying to deal with all these and things. And that phone's a dragon. It is a dragon, That phone man. is a motherfucking dragon. It is a dragon. It is not, it is, I have a lot of respect for that. And then, th- so for the next few days, you know, every little thing came with its own challenge. And, you know, another interesting thing I didn't mention is in the dark, when the third eye is like blasted open like that and you're having visions, like when I would eat my food, you know, which was raw vegan food, I would see sprouts and mushrooms. I would see everything in my third eye. When I soaped my hands, I would see bubbles. When I wiped my ass, I would see shit. Like I could just see it bursting in my third eye. So like this newfound appreciation for food and for like all of these other different things that I like, I didn't want to lose any of it. And I was so scared that I was going to lose some of it. And tell you the truth, you do. Yeah, man. You do. But you keep some of it too. And it was actually so overwhelming that I got home and I'm in this fragile but kind of awakened state. And I was able to give a lot of love to the people who I saw in those first few days, but I was also very fragile. And like one of the ways to escape the fragility is I started drinking. You know, like I was drinking hard kombuchas and wines and tequilas and like, okay, now this allows me to have a normal interaction with the normal world. You know, like I can fucking handle this from here. But I think I'd reached to those things so frequently before, not really aware of what I was doing, but now like the numbing nature of those things was like intensely obvious. Yeah, and to set the stage stage 10 is the return home and then stage 11 is probably the one that people 
get stuck on and eviscerate themselves the most, and it's resurrection. And it's it's this, you will forget what the sword was, but you remember what the sword was. And that stage is about remembering, you know, about remembering to remember. Yeah. I was so down on myself yesterday, to be honest, because I'd spent three out of the last four days. I guess, no, I guess it was uh, like Sunday and Monday. I'd spent three of the last four days kind of drinking. And not like drinking heavily, you know, like wake up in the morning and have a cup of vodka type of drinking. But like every evening I would have drinks and like it just numb, it numbed me sufficiently where it felt kind of normal. Like I could eat meat without thanking the, the being that it came from. I could, I was doing all the things that I kind of was before. The, there was a strength there, granted. It wasn't like complete you know it wasn't completely the same but it was close enough that i got really down and i think that's part of the resurrection stage is is the forgetting and then the the just incredible discontent and disappointment in oneself when you do forget and the key to that stage is self-forgiveness yeah yeah and knowing that you know you know the way and you know the way back and you remember it and i think fortunately i had all those voice recordings so you know for five hours i listened to all of them and transcribed the notes last night and that was super helpful and i have the video of me unblinding and these little things are going to be great reminders to help me on this on this journey and it's really you know ultimately it's it's the truths get really simple at the end Mm -hmm. but really challenging to live especially when you're back into the ordinary world because no one is going to see no one is going to see me in the way they're not going to see me with a sword or see me with a crown or see me with the laurels of my darkness journey. They're just going to see me as I am. So it's up to me to internally be. They'll only see your actions. Yeah. Uh, It's up to me. I don't have anybody else being like, and even if they do, it's on, on a limited way. Yeah. So it's not like I get to come back with a new costume. It's still me in the same costume. Yeah. The thing that comes to mind, I've, We've been playing with this hero's journey idea since we've known each other, and I haven't had this connection until now. The way that you most effectively resurrect is stage 12, which is to serve the medicine. And so if you extract out of this experience what the medicine is, every time you serve it, you remember. Because the only way to serve it is to remember. I've never had that connection until now, but that is how you remember, is you serve the medicine. And what is the serving of the medicine? Loving what is. Loving you, loving everybody here, loving my, everybody I encounter, loving loving the world as it is. Just loving it as it is. And then doing whatever I want to do. Like ultimately all these ideas I had, I got to change this house, I got to do this thing. It was like, no, you don't. You just had to change you. Because you're the thing that's the common denominator in everything. And your life is fucking awesome. So do whatever you want. Like the ultimate guidance when I was the most tapped in, it's like, yeah, man, do whatever you want. Whatever you want, just do it. Just do it in the way that, you know, do it in the way that you learned. Where you love yourself and you're being honest. Yeah, loving myself, being honest, and loving what is. And that's it. So here we are at the end of a deep initiation. And, you know, I'll go back to the darkness. There's no doubt about it. It's the purest, deepest medicine that I've ever encountered. And, uh, you know, it's not going to, it's not for everybody, you know, but it's also, it's, it's strange. It's because it's the deepest, most powerful, but also the most gentle because it's just you. Mm. It's just you. You know, like you're not taking anything. You're just removing things, removing all the other things. It reminds me of that Dali quote, I don't do drugs, I am drugs. Yeah, that's it. You become the drugs. Yeah. And you just see what your what your faculties and what your experiences really are capable of. Yeah, and it reminds me of one of my fif- one of my favorite ideas from Jung is this constant metaphor he uses that the soul is like an acorn. It knows its destiny is to be an oak tree. And you simply just have to remove all the blocks that you bring into your life. And then that energy that's in the acorn knows what to do. 
And like the ultimate container for that is the darkness. Yeah. Because without any external stimulus, your psyche will work through the things it needs to work through to break through the gravel. Yeah. And have that intention, but not the expectation of how you're going to get there. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. And yeah, and, and, and honestly, you know, however, take the pressure off yourself, you know, like most important thing is to enjoy this. Yeah, you know the game is set up for us to enjoy it, and if we enjoy it, then then we played well. If we really enjoyed it, and we help we helped others enjoy it too, you know, you played well. And you've always done your best, whoever you are out there. Like, forgive yourself. You've always done your best. You know, just try to enjoy and tap into the love of your life and that personal history you have. It was all perfect to get you to where you are now. You just have to see it that way. Like one of the takeaways I had was that. The universe gives only gifts. It's just up to us to classify them as such and decide mm. to play with them. Whatever traumas, whatever challenges, those are all gifts, you know? And that that is up to us. And even in the most challenging situation, like Viktor Frankl's situation, yeah. fuck, that's hard to take that as a gift. But he found a way to do it. He fucking did. And he found a way to do it by saying the last of the human freedoms is our ability to choose our attitude towards any given situation. And that idea he's been able to share with the rest of the world. So, yeah. you know, it's we have and that's the core of Stoic philosophy. The obstacle is the way, you know, resistance is assistance. You know, all of these wisdoms are there. Memento mori, remember that you're going to die so that. You can kind of release your attachments and enjoy the fullness of the life. Hoka hey. Yeah. You know, like today is a good day to die. Live so fully that it's okay if today is your day. And then if we're in a helicopter like Kobe was recently, and that's that's our day that we've lived in such a way that, you know, it's okay if that's yeah. our time. You know, so a lot of these things it just all kind of pulled them all together. Yeah, the thing that comes to mind is a cliche becomes wisdom through experience, mm -hmm. you know? And like, there are people who will hear those and they just think it's a cliche. And it's like, put yourself through an initiation ritual and that cliche will become wisdom. And you'll start to know it. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowing and you'll just have a gnosis, a different yeah. understanding of it. And I'd like to end with this quote from Joseph Campbell. So this is regarding the hero's journey. We have not even to risk the adventure alone. For the heroes of all time have gone before us. The labyrinth is thoroughly known. We have only to follow the thread of the hero's path. And where we had thought to find an abomination, we shall find God. And where we had thought to slay another, we shall slay ourselves. Where we had thought to travel outwards, we shall come to the center of our own existence. And where, we're, and where we had thought to be alone, we shall be with all the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there it is. Yeah. Thank you for helping guide and through this podcast, brother. It's well, been an honor to serve and live alongside you, and I look forward to doing this for many, many years, lifetimes, whatever our whatever our whatever our thing is. Let's Amen. keep it going. And thank you to everybody listening. I know this was a long podcast. Hopefully, you. You know, actually, I can release my attachment to what you got out of it because whatever you got out of it is fucking perfect. Yeah. You know, like, like so, whatever it was, if you hate it, if you love it, it's it's all your journey. And um, but you know, I'm just gonna continue to remember to love what is and love you as you are, whoever you are, whether it's hate, whether it's love, just love the journey that that transpires, and uh, and that's gonna help me to love myself and love my life and and live this way in the way that I want to live. Amen. Yep. Thank you everybody so much. Um, in the outro, I'll give the links and everything. If you're interested in the darkness retreat, uh, going the same place that I went to, there's very few places in the world that do this. And I think the place that I went is one of the best. Um, obviously they only have eight rooms. So, you know, hopefully some more people take up the, uh, they're going to be booked, take up Hurry the up. mantle, you know, take up the mantle and, uh, and, you know, help provide this in a really loving way. And, um, and darkness is a technology too. Yeah. You know, people think like, it's not as easy as you think to go pitch black mm. because any light that you have, you'll fixate on and it, be it ruins the experience. I even had this necklace on and this necklace randomly, these two beads glow in the dark. 
So when I would like go to the window with my blindfold and there would be light that would come in, I'd take my, and then I'd close the window and my blindfold would go off. My fucking necklace was lit. And I'd be like, oh no, my necklace is lit. Like, what the fuck am I gonna do? So I had to put it in like multiple socks because it was so blindingly wow. bright that it was distracting of the experience because you want that experience where your open eyes and your closed eyes are the same. So yeah. it takes a little bit of technology to get the darkness out completely. But craftsmanship. Yeah. Once you can get there, it's uh it's just such a powerful tool. All right. That's it. That's a wrap. I love you all so much and I love you, Godzi. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Yep. Peace. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to subscribe. Also, share with any friend that you think might benefit from it. And lastly, go to aubreymarcus.com, sign up for my newsletter diary, and you won't miss a thing.